Welcome to It's All Kicking Off, a What Culture football podcast. I'm Adam Wilborn from What Culture, joined by Adam Cleary from What Culture to discuss a burning football issue. But before we get into this, if you're a fan of this sort of thing, make sure you subscribe to What Culture Football, wherever you get your podcasts from, for daily football podcasts. But Adam Cleary, we are gathered here today to talk about the ongoing Newcastle United takeover and whether or not, Adam Cleary, it's finally happening. Yeah, I mean, in this, the season that will never end, it's nice to know that Newcastle still have the narrative that will never end because this has been going on since January, since February. And with every new revelation, with every claim that it's close to being done, there follows another two weeks of silence immediately afterwards. And then at the end of that, there is a revelation where everyone's like, oh, no, actually, this is the resolution, followed by two weeks of silence. But no, apparently now, this one, right now, this is now the resolution. So. I will just temper this. Everything I'm going to say on this podcast, anything we're going to talking, anything we're going to talk about, is done with a degree of, well, this has happened before. But that being said, there are more positive noises coming right now from sections where there have not been positive noises previously. So if you were ever looking for a time to take the cans out of the garage and put them in the proper fridge, probably say cautiously, now might be the time. Well, you say this has been going on since January. I mean, as a Newcastle fan, the talk of a takeover has been going on for years, hasn't it? Have you sort of grown numb to it? This is the thing. I went back and looked through all this. The first time Mike Ashley said he was going to sell Newcastle United was when they were first relegated under him about 18 months, two years after he first came in. The end of that season where they had the whole fallout with Keegan walking away from the club and it transpiring that they had repeatedly lied in court and to the fan base about what was going on, how the club was structured. As soon as they went down, he just held his hands and went, well, I never said I'd be any good at running a football club. Don't worry, we're going to sell it immediately. Then, of course, he couldn't find anybody who was willing to buy this absolute skip fire for the money he wanted. Then they got back up. They enjoyed a degree of success immediately after that. Obviously, the new recruitment policies with the brought Graham Carr in and they built that side that finished fifth. That made it look like it was a more appealing proposition. People started giving Ashley credit for the way he structured the club because Newcastle was starting to achieve without you know, spending ludicrous sums of money. I think they finished above Chelsea and Liverpool and Spurs that season. And then, um, and then of course, the classic thing happened where they were in a good position. There was a chance to build something, a chance to show some ambition. And after finishing fifth, like literally one game away from uh, the Champions League, their summer acquisition was Vernon Anita. And that was it. And they let Denver Bar go in January and Kabai was gone a few years later and they started dismantling the squad, which inevitably, after the appointment of Steve McLaren, led to them going down again. And there was more talk about selling. Basically, every time the catastrophic mismanagement of this club by a man who has absolutely no idea what he's doing with it, every time that comes back to bite him, he claims that he is selling it. And then I think just finally a, a realistic investor a realistic proposition for selling it finally came in in the shape of amanda stavely and pif and the rubin brothers and now one way or another this is the end game for it all this is even if, if somehow this doesn't materialize he's now so far past the point of being able to run this club that he'll probably give it away if this fall, <laughs> if this somehow collapses so yes i am completely numb to all this to answer the question you asked me 15 minutes ago um Everything when it comes to this is I will believe it when I see it. Even with, even with transfers at this club, I don't, until they're standing outside the ground holding the shirt, it has not happened as far as I'm concerned. But again, this is the closest it has been. While it hasn't actually happened, this feels like the closest it has been to happening ever. Yeah, I distinctly remember I obviously moved up to Newcastle about three or so years ago and went from being, you know, quite a casual fan who'd heard rumblings of it to hear talk of it a lot more regularly. And I remember that interview he gave with Sky Sports about a year ago or so, towards the end of sort of last season. And I remember seeing that and foolishly thinking, oh, well, that's it then. And sort of messaging you and chatting to you and you going... That doesn't mean anything. That's it was yeah. been said a million times. Mike Ashley using his mouth to speak is possibly the least of all of all the figures in football. Like could be your blatters in this, your anybody's. I don't think anybody has ever been so willing to just say something without any plans to back it up as Mike Ashley did it. The, the day they um the a time before we went down, the most recent time, uh, when McLaren was about to be brought in. 
Um, they'd been relatively safe in the league, uh, lower mid, sort of upper mid table. Uh, when Pardew had been, <laughs> when Crystal Palace had given us money to take Alan Pardew away, which still actually ranks as one of my favourite days as a Newcastle fan. <laughs> and instead of getting a manager in, they just went, oh, we'll just give it to the shouty man who sits who sits in the dugout with him, and that'll be fine. And then they went this slide down the table, not winning for something like 10 games, to the point where they needed to win on the last day to guarantee they'd stay up. And that was, of course, a game that's remembered for Jonas Gutierrez coming back from cancer and scoring the goal that effectively saved the club. But Ashley uh, did an interview after that game where he said, this is never going to happen on my watch again. We're going to invest in the club. We're going to get this new manager and we're going to restructure everything. We're going to be pushing forward. I am not leaving this club until we have won something or we've qualified for the Champions League. This is, you have my solemn vow. We're going to really change things going forward. And 12 months later, they were relegated. Like, no plan in place. His plan was to bring in McLaren, of all people, and chuck 80 or 90 million away on a load of absolutely hopeless players. Um, so Ashley saying he's going to sell the club or this, that, and the other has never carried any weight with Newcastle fans. Like the man has been proven to have lied in court and to Parliament, and because you know he's Mike Ashley doesn't seem to face any serious repercussions for this. So him, like, this is the thing as well. I'm saying until they're standing outside the club with the shirt, I don't class this takeover as having happened. Like Mike Ashley could physically show me his bank balance and go, "Look, there they are. We've sold it," and I still wouldn't believe it. <laughs> Yeah, just to update you, though, a tweet coming out today from NUFC360 on Twitter says, it's now claimed the Premier League are on the verge of giving the green light to the Saudi-led consortium after the Kingdom launched a new crackdown on TV piracy. Uh, loads of other reports uh, about kind of the British government wanting to strengthen ties with Saudi Arabia and that kind of being a part of all this. Uh, we're not going to tell too deeply, obviously, into the ins and outs of that. That's a whole other issue. But what what, what happens next for you, Cleary? Well, just on that point about how there's been these big changes made or these proposed big changes made um, by the Saudis, which are going to enable the green light for this. I think a big misconception people have had about this takeover and certainly the process of how it works is that, you know, a consortium puts a bit together. That bit gets accepted. They go through all the due diligence stage to make sure that it's actually feasible. Then they go, right, here is our takeover. They hand it to the Premier League and the Premier League look at it and go, hmm. Yes or mm, no. So I think people are waiting for a decision to be made. Like they have to evaluate the whole situation, then just green light it or not, which I think to led to a lot of the confusion about why this is taking so long. Because it's like, well, it only took them a week to do these other takeovers or two weeks to do this takeover. Why is this one taking so long? And I think people don't realize it's an open dialogue. You know, they, they present this takeover. You know, we've got the money to do this. We've got an agreement with the selling club. We've done this, we've done that. And then the Premier League look at it and go, okay. Well, either everything's fine and we can green light that or, well, we have concerns about this. Can you prove you can do that? Because we've seen lower down in the British football pyramid, the, the fit and proper persons test. There's been some complete charlatans take over clubs further uh, down the divisions. Not naming any names, eh? So I think the Premier League are very keen to avoid situations like that because it damages the global brand of the Premier League. Like can you, if, if there was another Leeds United situation now, you know, it would be catastrophic for for the overall, like the the glow, like the Premier League sells its broadcasts all over the world, which is where all this money comes from. And if there's, you know, these disasters going on all the time, it's not something they really want to be going to TV stations with or getting involved in the bidding rights, et cetera, et cetera. Don't get me wrong. Teams like your West Ham's and your Everton's who spend a lot of money and don't go anywhere or possibly in the case of West Ham this season even go down. I mean, that's fair game. That's just mismanagement. Uh, like on a, on a footballing level, but they don't want people to come in and be exposed. So I think knowing that there could be some potential repercussions, certainly with the Saudis' involvement in a lot of this illegal streaming, things like that, um, is it's something they're concerned about. So they've obviously been in a massive open dialogue with them. And if they're prepared to make changes in order to get this to go through, then, you know, good, good for them. Uh, this is... <laughs> It's going to be interesting to see precisely what concessions have been made and precisely how strongly the British government have lent on the Premier League because, you know, the, the reservations a lot of people have about this takeover, certainly from corners of the press and from corners of the fan base who are kind of acutely aware of how this element of the Saudi government works and why they make these giant investments. It's, you know, there's nobody in the Saudi royal family right now who thinks, oh, do you know what? Remember Shearer? Oh, I should go, like, spend loads of money on that football club. This is being done you know, as part of a, of a wider political programme. And if the government 
I want to encourage that. That's that's kind of other. I've completely forgot what you asked me to be honest. Well, what I wanted to ask you actually off the back of all this is you've mentioned let's say questionable takeovers. You know, you can think of five, ten, fifteen off the top of your head. On the one, one hand, are you kind of like, come on, for God's sake, get Mike Ashley out of my club? But also on the other hand, are you thinking, you know what, it's maybe probably best for this club that they go through the right processes? <sighs> this. Uh... The thing is, it's very difficult for me, this. Uh, anybody who's watched our wrestling channel knows I've done a lot of coverage on the Saudi General Sports Authority and how they've done business with WWE. And there is a suggestion that part of what they're doing in Newcastle United is going to be along sort of the same lines. It's going to be an element of sports washing. It's going to be there as a bit of a public relations tool for the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and certainly the perceptions the rest of the Western world have about that. And... Don't get me wrong, like, if they want to give us £200 million every single transfer window and we can just do whatever we want with that, as a Newcastle United fan, great. It's been absolutely turgid to watch this football club since Mike Ashley took over. The lack of ambition, the lack of spending power, the lack of just now on how to do anything. This is this huge positives to take from this, but at the same time, as much as I hate my football club, effectively just being a giant global advert for a horrible tracksuit emporium. I don't want them to be, you know, a, a pleasant public face for a regime with terrible human rights abuses. So I'm delighted. I'm delighted. I'm not, I couldn't possibly be happy that Mike Ashley's going to leave, but hard conversations are going to have to happen after that. And scrutiny is going to need to be applied. And it isn't just a case of one bad person is gone. Ergo, this is completely good because there are like big questions, big, big questions about what this takeover is going to entail and what it's going to be used for. And just it's open like this is this is the thing I just want to say about this, by the way, because as a Newcastle fan, you've read a you you read a lot of guff about this. And there were certain corners of the press saying this is somehow Newcastle United fans' fault or their responsibility, or they should be doing something about this. They have no say in this at all, whatsoever. We didn't have a say when Ashley came in. We don't have a say in how Ashley runs the club. And despite our best efforts, we've never really changed his mind on anything. You know, he's run the club the way he wants to, and he's going to sell the club to who he wants to, and whoever comes in is going to run the club the way they want to. The scrutiny that should be applied to this is from the Premier League, and it's from the wider corners of the media. 99% of people who go to that stadium have absolutely no idea about geopolitical ramifications of this. They have no idea about the human rights abuses in Saudi Arabia. They just want a bit of escapism. They just want to go watch a football team that's actually going to try and win a game of football. And if these conversations need to be had, then they need to be done, you know, in a way that recognises the fact that the fans have absolutely no control or say in this whatsoever. It's not their responsibility to fix this. Putting the moral issues to one side, if we can. Um, yeah, we're going to get Mbappe, yeah! <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you know, as a Chesterfield fan, we're supposedly going through a takeover at the same time, and we're sat there going, hey, maybe we'll actually get back to, you know, football, League One, League Two, back where we were. As a Newcastle fan, what do you think fans expect off the back if this takeover happens? See, this is the thing. It's so... Of all the stuff you read as a Newcastle fan about, you know, oh, they're just, hound up, oh, they just didn't like Ashley because he's not from around here and stuff like that. Easily the biggest load of rubbish is that, you know, we expect to be winning things. Like, we never, we haven't won, we haven't won anything since 1969. Like, there's not, a, very few Newcastle fans were even alive the last time we won anything. Obviously, Scott Parker's triumph as captain leading us to the Intertoto Cup that time, notwithstanding. Um... Genuinely, it's the, the problem with Ashley has not been that he doesn't get us in the top four every season. It's not that he doesn't chuck away loads and loads of money. It's the constant lies, effectively, and the constant mismanagement and the constant, like, just where he uses the club to parade his, his little band of charlatans and has absolutely no connection to the city or has no real interest in managing it as, a, as an element of the community. Genuinely, just, like... Just try, <laughs> you know what I mean. Like you know, all these statements about Newcastle. I think it was, I can't remember who who it was. I think it was either Lambias or Chris Moore came out and said Newcastle United is going to be the best club it can be, pound for pound. And just that one statement alone is just like, what? Well, why? Why should? Why should we? Why can't we aspire to try and go do a little bit better every now and then, or really try and prioritise a cup run, or you know maybe just invest in little things here and there, like the training ground supposed to be an absolute joke. In the Premier League, just go and spend a little bit more money on stuff like that, and it's just 
there's a, there's a very famous banner Newcastle United fans once took to a game which was in the middle of all this, which does conveniently get left out when these conversations crop up. And it was, we do not expect a team that wins, but we do expect a team that tries. And I think that's like, there's so, there's so much goodwill between Newcastle United fans and this current side, pretty much the team uh, largely that Rafa Benitez was able to assemble because it was full of players who tried who like really gave it their all, who, you know, you weren't walking away from games where you've been defeated thinking, well, if they just pulled their finger out, they could have got something there. There was a genuine sense every time you walked away from that stadium of, well, that's a disappointing result and there's questions about so-and-so and and he shouldn't be getting in the team and all that, but can I fault them for effort? Not really. And one of the biggest uh, plus points to Steve Bruce's time in charge is that that hasn't changed when he's come in, you can see that effort from him as well. And players still really do fight and they really do leave everything out there. And so just taking that, but combining it with like, maybe a little bit of ambition every now and then, maybe go and get in somebody because we'll think they'll do a good job for the team, not just because, you know, they're going to be inexpensive or might have high sell-on value. Um, Ultimately, I have absolutely no idea what to expect from all of this. We don't know what financial fair play is going to do. We don't know what the changes to the transfer market are going to be with everything that's going on in the world at the minute. I don't think anybody's getting carried away with anything. I don't think there's any aspirations whatsoever to be getting into the Champions League in the next couple of years. If you look at the money West Ham and Everton have spent, and they haven't even looked like cracking the upper ends of the league. Um, I think the best case for any club right now is you sort of look at a Tottenham model, like come in, change the philosophy of the side, you know, start developing things, get a couple of good transfers in there, but build a lot around the youth side and stuff. And then see where you get with it. You know, maybe you produce a very exciting team, maybe just produce a difficult to beat one. Don't really know. That's very sensible. And I do want to get onto the banter signings that could be coming Newcastle. Oh, can we? Of course. Uh, before we do that, though, uh, you mentioned Rafa Benitez and Steve Bruce there. I was watching Match of the Day 2 last night and they were arguing about who should manage Newcastle next season if the takeover happens. They were making the case for Steve Bruce off the back of that excellent win over Sheffield United mm-hmm. uh, yesterday. Obviously, Rafa's name has been mentioned. Maurizio Pochettino uh, is another uh, name on people's lips. Who should manage, in your eyes at least, Newcastle United next season? I'm, just, I'm glad you brought a match of the day too there because um, I don't think I've ever heard a case of a man just saying something because he needs to be talking and not actually thinking about it more than Phil Neville. Saying <laughs> like, don't, this is the thing. I think Steve Bruce has done an excellent job. I think he's done a brilliant job in the circumstances. But Phil Neville was sitting there saying, I actually think they play better football. I think they're a better side than, than they were when, when, when Rafa Benitez was there. Like, lowest goal scored in the league all season. Like, <sighs> Steve Bruce deserves a lot of credit for Newcastle not being in a relegation fight this season. Mm-hmm. Absolutely he does. But what's got glossed over is Newcastle weren't expected to be in a relegation fight this season. That question only came about when they appointed Steve Bruce. <laughs> and literally the day he was announced as the new manager, their odds, I think, they were, they were looking at finishing poor, something like... Between, I'd say, 12th and 14th this season was kind of roughly where everyone was expecting them to be. If you looked at like, the odds for finishing, that's kind of where they were. Then Rafa left and they appointed Steve Bruce and we immediately dropped into the bottom three. And then they allowed Perez to leave and didn't really replace him with anyone who looked like they were going to be a ready-made replacement. Obviously, Sam Max Man's done a great job coming in, but he wasn't expected to be replacing. And indeed, he hasn't the amount of goals Perez scored. And then, and then Rondon left and they replaced him with this Brazilian lad who has absolutely... No record for this club, in this country, on this division, anything like that. And then they were immediately stalled as relegation favourites. So under those circumstances, Steve Bruce has done a fantastic job. But these are only circumstances that have come about literally because of his appointment and literally because of the way the club is being run. Now, I have to say, I watched all of Rafa Benitez's games as Newcastle United manager. And I have watched all of Steve Bruce's games as Newcastle United manager. And they're not better by any stretch of the imagination. They... They try just as hard. They work just as hard. They don't score more goals. They're certainly not more exciting. Yes, we have, you know, Sam Maximan's there, who's a great player to watch. And Almiron's finally coming into the side the way he was envisaged to. So there is an exciting element of how they play together there. But we have to be realistic here. Newcastle United are safe from trouble this year because a lot of teams didn't finish them off. You know, you go back to the Chelsea game. Chelsea should have absolutely wiped the floor with Newcastle and they stole a win in the last minute. And Man City dropped their guard when they went 2-1 up very late on. We were able to snatch one back. We've been very fortunate with a lot of results. And a lot of other teams around us have just, you know, they've absolutely 
you know, drop their trousers this season. Like Norwich really struggled to build on their strong start. Aston Villa never quite got going. Um, Newcastle have been fortunate this season. They deserve huge credit. Steve Bruce deserves huge credit. But this idea that if a new owner's coming in and they've got ambitions of really pushing them up the league, that Steve Bruce is the man to do it, I, I think that's, as it usually is, it's a case of the fact that Phil Neville knows Steve Bruce on a personal level. So he wants to say nice, supportive things about him because he's his mate, which is a lot of a problem you get with a lot of um, punditry in this country. I asked for who could come in. Uh, this is the thing. I personally wouldn't want to sack Steve Bruce straight away. I don't think he'd be the manager to take them on, but I think you, you would lay out expectations and you'd say, look, we really want to be going up the division this year. You know, we can't just be, you need to score a lot more goals. You need to sort of look at the players you want to bring in. And whether that means, you know, you give him a year, fair enough. You want to move, this is the thing. If you wanted to move Steve Bruce out of the management, management position and keep him in the club, I think you'd probably be quite happy with that. Mm. Pochettino, I don't know, Pochettino would be a fantastic appointment, but I think it's a lot on Mauricio Pochettino to drop him in and be like, right, okay, so uh, relegation scraps or the championship for the last three seasons, four seasons, five seasons, actually. Uh, <laughs> any chance of finishing sixth? <laughs> I think, yeah, it spoke volumes on Match of the Day too, that they were like, look, look how much better they are. Their win percentage has gone up by 1% and their yeah. points per game has gone up by 0.1 as well. And I thought... Yeah. Yeah, there's not much difference. I was lucky enough to go to a few Newcastle games. I went to Newcastle Burnley this season, which is sort of exemplary of um, how they've improved. And they sort of, you know, I, I, I don't want to lessen it because they're on a cup run at the end of the day. Um, but it feels like they've sort of stumbled into that to a certain extent, um, as much as, you know, Newcastle fans have been crying out for a cup run uh, for some time. Now, I promise we will get on to the banter signings after one more question. Uh, you mentioned many players there. Who do you think they should keep? Who should they use to sort of, rather than, you know, doing what I would do on Football Manager and just sacking everyone and signing 25 new players, who are the players they really need to retain and kind of build this team around for you? The crazy thing is, and I've never been able to say this as a Newcastle United fan, right now I wouldn't say anybody who's anywhere near the first team is a priority to get rid of. Um even John Joe Shelby, who's looked at times like his time here was finished, he'd offered all he could. He's even managed to... In fact, I would say Shelby's probably been the biggest success story uh, of Steve Bruce this season. He's managed to turn him around. He's managed to get him playing a bit more sensibly. Not everything is a Hollywood pass anymore. He tends to be far more positionally disciplined. Um, there's not a single person in that squad who I think, oh, you'd 